All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to Strategic Risk Management for Successful Mergers and Acquisitions, a webinar presented by Passageways in association with Stuart Levine and Associates. In this webinar, we will discuss the current M&A issues as it pertains to strategy for effective risk mitigation. We are very pleased to be joined today by Stuart R. Levine, Chairman and CEO of Stuart Levine and Associates, Paul M. Puja, a partner with Holland and Knight LLP. My name is Michael E. Rubin. I am a member of the onboard board management software team, and I will serve as your moderator today. Before we begin, we do have a little housekeeping to go over. First, after the webinar today, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar, and you will also be able to download the presentation. Second, during the webinar, please feel free to enter your questions right in the GoToMeeting panel. We promise we will try to get to as many of your questions during the webinar, so please feel free to use that questions panel early and often. Third, as I mentioned previously, today's webinar is being brought to you by Passageways. We are the developer of Onboard, an award-winning board meeting software that's actually easy to use, delights directors, and empowers administrators. Onboard. Learn more at www.passageways.com. And lastly, I would like to do a brief introduction of our panelists. First, Stuart Levine is a governance expert and has served on over 15 for-profit and non-for-profit boards. His consulting firm works with CEOs and boards to ensure effective governance, board culture, and C-suite leadership that drives strategy, engages and inspires talent, and achieves sustainable performance. Paul Oguja is a corporate services attorney specializing in advising boards of directors and senior management in mergers and acquisitions, capital raising, risk management, and governance matters. His experience as chairman and president of Clifton Bank Corp Incorporated, or CB CSBK, and chairman of an international law firm brings significant financial industry expertise. And now, without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to give you Stuart Levine of Stuart Levine and Associates, LLC. Stuart, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to Mohanish and the rest of the team at Passageways for uh, hosting us. What we are about uh, in, in this uh, webinar today is providing information and something that we uh, Paul and myself respect so much is the capacity to learn and I'll call it the commitment to learn. So let me acknowledge and thank all the people who uh, have joined us today and are participating. I think with Paul and myself, what this conversation will do is uh, expose uh, you to some very practical experience. Paul uh, has been a CEO, as Michael pointed out, of a publicly traded corporation. Uh, as well as an attorney and counsel uh, to organizations, particularly in the financial services sector, who've gone through M&A work, myself uh, included, as a CEO, a board member, and then an advisor uh, to those uh, mergers. And so what you can expect from us today is some very grounded, very practical conversation. I would also invite our participants today to be aware that we will ask uh, some questions as we go through, not only what Michael referenced vis-a-vis -vis sending us your questions so that uh, we can reflect what's on your uh, mind that would be helpful, but also uh, to, I'll call it, fine-tune and sharpen our conversation. So let's have a fast look at the agenda. We will talk about strategic risk and strategic planning and, in fact, effective M&A because in preparing for this conversation, uh, we were always struck and still are by the fact that 80% of all mergers are not accretive and for some reason or another go off the tracks. And we'll try to give you some of what that experience tells us. And probably no surprise, but we'll talk about issues like culture and technology and a governance uh, construct. And so the responsibility for an effective merger really does lie uh, with the boards being engaged at the right levels and how, in fact, uh, the leadership uh, perceives uh, that. So we'll lay out some of those issues. We'll have a Q&A, and then we'll get to some uh, feedback. 
So the next page, Michael, talking about strategic risk, what really triggered the design of this program was uh, Paul and our team uh, were meeting when we had a conversation about the Office of Controller uh, and defining uh, risk. And we thought that uh, just to get some common ground, and, and I know based on the participants, we have people from all kinds of organizations, a vast array, a core in credit unions, a core in, in financial services and banks and other. And I think when we talk about risk, you calibrate them uh, around issues of safety and soundness, which is so important. And the fact that 29% of banks exhibit moderate or increasing high levels of strategic risk based on the OCC's uh, recent uh, risk report. And so, uh, Paul, you want to weigh in a little bit and, and tell us your feelings, share with us your feelings on the controller of currencies uh, memorandum, please. Uh, sure, Stuart, and, and, and thank you for the introduction. Great to be with everybody. You know, uh, I, I echo what you had to say, Stuart. I mean, really what's, what struck us together uh, right after this strategic assessment came out by the OCC was um, how it can be, in fact, applied pretty broadly. Uh, it obviously speaks to financial institutions, but it can speak to uh, different types of charters, uh, whether it's a credit union, a bank, a savings bank, a state uh, institution, as well as other uh, industries, regulated and non-industries, because because if you look at it, uh, you can really tell from the first definition and the first bullet point, uh, really the seriousness and the breadth of how um, the OCC looks at this risk, uh, the, the idea of a, a lack of responsiveness to changes potentially being, uh, being very fatal. Uh, so as we read this, uh, I think it's fair to say we looked at this together, and it's not just about managing technology or managing change, but really it goes to the risk of not identifying where the institution is going and not identifying um, what the leadership of the institution wants the institution to be. So while I think some are doing a great job in this, re in this respect, a lot of institutions are using uh, their board meetings and their critical sessions to discuss strategic risk. Um, certainly not everyone, and hopefully we can uh, share some insights into how that can be done. So, you know, uh, as a steward of capital, which sounds like a pretty high and mighty concept, but I think it is, whether you're a director, whether you're a CEO or a senior officer, uh, the fact of the matter is when you have capital, how you deploy it starts to define a strategic uh, risk and in fact will doing something and, and taking some action. And some of these bullet points, which we won't dwell on too much, but really speak to, and, and you know, it's interesting, uh, we were working with a $400 million credit union uh, last year. And one of the strategic discussions, with, with people were talking about neighboring credit unions, larger, smaller, and so forth. And in the conversation, we said, hey, it's not only neighboring credit unions or banks, but it's somebody like uh, Apple, as an example, forming up to uh, a credit card model, uh, Apple working with, as an example, Goldman Sachs. And at the end of the day, when you look at your customers, your members, uh, they are going to be driven by products and services, and the loyalty factor uh, is redefined. And so whether it's Amazon considering uh, checking accounts, whether it's Google, fact of the matter is the risks are now, I'll call it global in nature, without regard to the community that we all live in, but they are global in nature and denote and have the, the impact uh, to destabilize a franchise pretty fast. Michael, let's go to the next uh, page and talk about uh, this risk-averse mindset. And uh, Paul, I'm going to tee this up and, and let you take us through it. But the notion of uh, a, a, I'll call it a calm board uh, that uh, is, I don't want to say sleepy, but, but used to its own way. Uh, but now we're in the middle of this uh, new uh, digital innovative uh, revolution. And talk to us a little bit about its impact on lower returns and what that denotes for members, shareholders, stakeholders uh, throughout the uh, organization. 
Sure. Uh, and again, I won't go through every every bullet, but uh, I think there are some some very helpful ones on, on this slide. Uh, th this is we, we pointed out a couple of things that uh, represent significant pressure um, on on the industry, especially the financial institutions uh, industry. Um, and we really, it's a question of uh, getting ahead of these things and making sure that there's a mindset at the board level to uh, and the management level to to get ahead. And I do think it, it may seem dramatic about change or die, but certainly in fast moving industries uh, and banking and credit unions and the like have not traditionally been fast moving industries. But as as things change within those industries, uh, I think there is kind of an admonition there that uh, the changes have to be um, you have to stay ahead of your changes at, at the leadership level. You, you know, there's one thing to focus on um, organic growth, meaning uh, that may seem like it's a status quo, but it doesn't have to be status quo. You can really focus on organic growth within the context of, of, of these risks. But I think the danger is, is really to be lulled into thinking that the status quo is going to be acceptable. I think that becomes a, a, a little more a, a little more dangerous. I, I would say though that I have been on a personal level, Stuart, been encouraged that risk management uh, in terms of uh, growth and m a has become a little more uh, prevalent at the forefront of board meetings that I, that I've attended. I think even smaller institutions uh, have been focusing on this uh, and have changed their mindset a little bit even within you know the last uh, year or so because uh, because of the things on this page some of the pressures that have been um, uh, that have been um, in front uh, of these boards and management teams so I do think it's encouraging but I also think it's you know it's extremely uh, serious in order to kind of gauge and direct the mindset of a, of a board because status quo is just not going to work in these fast-moving times and industries so let's uh, talk in practical terms. As I listen to you carefully, there are two or three things that come to my mind. Number one, you can have what I would call a well-managed, predictable financial services, uh, financial institution. Uh, moving ahead, organic growth is in the single digits, but looks and feels good. But we're dealing with, I would call it almost a violent uh, I'll call it consumer base that will move very fast. And what they're asking us now, uh, and as we get involved in advising uh, boards and, and organizations, what we hear a lot of is from the consumer side is, well, what are you doing to protect me my, and my family security uh, from cyber attacks and things like that? And in my mind, that raises one of the, I'll call it fundamental issues of whether you should engage in a discussion to merge because if you're in a situation where you do not have enough capital to invest in some technology platform and we understand that there is no one no 100 percent uh, cyber uh, protection program but engage in some type of protection around cyber threats uh, you i would say put your institution uh, at risk. And the second thing, Paul, I wanted to uh, mention it and have you opine on is in an M&A uh, activity and some experience we've seen, sometimes people come together and they don't dig deep enough into asking questions and surveying what the heck does the uh, NUCO corporation or the acquired uh, entity look like vis-a-vis -vis their technology platform. And I would say there's great peril if you can't get under the hood uh, and understand what the strength of the technology platform of a, an entity that you're interested in acquiring. And so when we talk about strategic risk and M&A activity, for me, uh, that's what our experience uh, tells us. And I'm curious, Paul, how you respond to that. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great summary, Stuart. Thank you. I, I think there's, there's a couple of points to make there. Um, the the first with respect to cyber and what i would call uh defensive uh technology certainly there's no question that 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 institutions need to to keep up with it uh 
in, in order to really to uh, to be competitive. But on that competitive note, there's also the customer face, customer facing type technology that uh, would promote your business, not just protect it. Mm -hmm. So it's really too it's too faceted. But the thing that I, I, I think I wanted to pick up on on what you said, which was 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 extremely helpful, is there's just no question. And me having been a, a CEO as well as an advisor to, um, to to boards and management, there's just no question that a lot of the M&A activity that we're seeing is being driven by technology, whether it's right. the defensive, defensive or the offensive. Meaning, mm -hmm. uh, you need you need more resources to protect, or you need more resources to to compete. And then the second part is, you're a hundred percent right technology platform of the resulting institution can and should be paramount to any due diligence uh, review. Um, anytime you're expecting uh, to merge into an institution for the benefit of your stakeholders, it's, it's, it's an important due diligence inquiry uh, regarding how the technologies are going to, to mesh. And frankly, you really wouldn't uh, do a transaction unless the technology on a combined basis is improved, um, meaning the one plus one equals three theory. So I think that's a very good, uh, a good explanation of why it fits into the M and A uh, arena, Stuart. I, I think also in kind of listening to you, Paul, um, thinking about it from a director or, for that matter, a CEO's uh, seat. You know, when you look at an acquisition. You know, what questions can your team ask uh, of the other organization? And one that always strikes me, and, and I would say should be on the dashboard of every board of directors, and it's what is the data indicate about your internal phishing ex uh, exercises? Because that will tell you, A, how current they are, B, the frequency, and C, how strong the culture of that organization, and for that matter, your own, is as it relates to safety, soundness, and the culture. And so asking questions in a transactional cycle will uh, provide some insights into the embrace of what I think you and I share vis-a-vis -vis, uh, that's where the capital uh, risk. Would you agree or disagree with that? No, I do. I, I, I do agree. And I do, as I mentioned, uh, not to get too technical, but the fact is it does make its way into due diligence and certainly people in the technology areas of these institutions will address some of the technical concerns. But from a board and CEO perspective, I can speak to two transactions going on right now, one in the banking space that I'm working on and one in the credit union space. Um, I've been very impressed by how uh, the discussion has um, between the leadership has focused on on things uh, technology related. Uh, technology was important, enhanced technology was important. In one case, to the uh, stakeholder being the shareholders, meaning that the combined company of the banking institution would be better and stronger. And in the other case, with uh, respect to the, the credit unions, there's been a tremendous emphasis on the, the member and how will the member benefit? What right. is the return to member with respect to and technology being was has been at the center of that. So I've been extremely impressed and encouraged that that has uh, made its way into the into the dialogue, question asking and question taking part of of due diligence. And it starts early, as we know, and I'm sure we'll touch on that as we go along about preparedness. Hundred percent. So let's go to the next slide because we talk about existential. Uh, threat or a call to arms, and periodically will, people will say, well, how do I get access to that information so that I can push that data up against what we're talking about? Uh, and, and if you look at uh, some of the points we put out there, number one, as a data point, without regard to your business, every director, every board, and if the culture is strong, which is what I think uh, it becomes very important. All of us should have access to customer slash member satisfaction because that data tells us how well we are designing uh, products and services for the people that we serve. Uh, our understanding of the culture as it relates to the employees and their understanding 
of the mission, actual data points that say, not only, I'll call it a feel-good exercise, but are they understanding uh, the vision? Are they trying to live, not in a self-righteous way, but in a good way? What does the data tell us about employee uh, satisfaction? And then uh, the ability to retain and attract, uh, I'll call it the uh, world-class talent or the best talent you can get your uh, hands on, because absent that, I would maintain from our experience, Paul, that that's a uh, strategic uh, default. A strategic weapon means we really understand the attraction and retention of talent. Uh, you know, we have a client out there who was just recognized by uh, Glassdoor. And, you know, it, it, it makes you feel pretty good about an organization because it's a reflection of what the values are of the senior leadership and the board and what the culture is vis-a-vis -vis the way people uh, relate to it. And so we share the, that with our participants today in, a, in a just a very uh, direct way that's it, because people say frequently, well, how do I know how the culture is responding in this world that we're talking about, uh, which is pretty uh, difficult out there? So let's go down to the next uh, page where we talk about strategic risk part of the uh, strategic planning discussion. And I think the placeholder here, and then Paul, I, I'm interested in your thinking on it. The days of having strategic planning, at least from our experience, uh, as an annual or uh, every two years, you would go to an offsite, you'd have a nice dinner, you'd play around the golf, and uh, you'd hear a series of presentations, fundamentally are mercifully over. When you talk about strategic risk, which is really important and it implies a serious responsibility, then strategy and a discussion relating to strategy has to be incorporated in every board meeting. And I'm curious, uh, Paul, how you relate to that. Um, I, I, again, I, I totally agree. The, uh, and I think it does relate to the previous slide because I do think it is a question of existential threat or call to arms. And I guess what we're suggesting in that slide is that this, the, the strategic risk and strategic planning and the strategic risk element of strategic planning does uh, does really go to the question of um, are you going to be relevant? And that's the mm -hmm. existential threat. Are you going to be relevant? The more positive aspect is the call to arms, of course, which is uh, you are going to be relevant and there's a determination made that you can be relevant and that becomes then an opportunity. So, mm -hmm. um, once again, I have been encouraged and that uh, in the board meetings I've attended with financial institutions that uh, this is becoming um, more serious and more a part of, of what the institutions are doing uh, at, at every meeting. And as it relates specifically to, to M&A, Stuart, the last uh, bullet on the, um, on the slide, I, I really do see institutions in the banking industry and uh, Especially and lately, to be to be perfectly blunt, especially in the credit union industry lately, where business combinations, assessing the possibility of business combinations, um, either from the quote sell side or or the buy side, is making its way into strategy, and and the risk of doing them, or not doing them has become a, a focal point for board discussion, which I think is, is, is very healthy and uh, really apropos to what we're trying to, to, to convey today. So let's go to the next slide because I think there we have a very grounded uh, discussion because I've uh, been advising, our firm been advising CEOs for a long time in these areas. And frequently the CEO will talk to you one-on-one -on -one and say, you know, what do I do with my board? They don't understand the deployment of capital, what I'm up against as it would relate to technology investment, acquisition of technology, leadership, and things like that. And I think one of the very smart responses is an effective board assessment that really takes a look at, too, is how are we doing in the market? What does the data tell us about the ultimate uh, customer? And by the way, what are the competitors' capabilities, and ultimately, it really does fall around culture. And culture, we would define for common sense in our work here today in conversation as one behavior at a time. 
But do we have the guts to look in the mirror and say, hey, through an independent lens, uh, some days if I look in the mirror pool, um, you know, am I having a good hair day? Some days I do, some days I don't. And if you are in an organization and if the culture is not, uh, let's call it, uh, as strong and embracing of the issues that we're talking about, succession planning and so forth, then you really have to have a hard discussion with yourself. And that's why uh, where we live, an independent board assessment provides data that says, hey, look, this is not a check the box exercise. This has serious strategic and risk and liability uh, for boards. Uh, and and it, these are data points uh, in a culture. Any thoughts on uh, that, Paul? Well, actually, I was going to ask you a question because I, yeah. I think it, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. And I guess my question, since you've done this, uh, these the board assessments quite a bit how how would you relate board assessments to and looking in the mirror guts to look in the mirror to to m a it, it, the thought i imagine is that the uh, the concept i imagine is that it it just identifies that people are or are not thinking about them and that they're not they are or are not being strategic on such weighty topics is that fair I think it's fair to say that there's a very important word for me, and that is learning. So whether you were a global CEO, whether you've been in the community for 30 years, uh, you know, representing a certain constituency, the fact of the matter is, if you're not learning, it's very difficult for a board member uh, who is not committed to learning to participate in those strategic discussions. It's also difficult uh, to engage in what I will call uh, the succession planning discussion. We're involved with a client very recently. And what we designed is a program that doesn't just look at succession planning, let's call it for the top three or four named executive officers, but we then say, hey, you need to drive that thing 25 down so that each director over the year can meet three or four other people because that tells us, through an assessment, how effective our senior leadership team is, and that requires a certain commitment. And the, what we hear in the assessment is uh, sometimes there's always one out of 11 uh, directors that is either falling asleep, not coming prepared to a board meeting, or can't participate in a really good conversation with people of different backgrounds and uh, understand, uh, I'll call it, very rapidly evolving marketplaces. And so that's where uh, I think the word character has to come into the conversation. And that's why from our experience, Paul, uh, you know, and it sounds a little funny, some days you do look in the mirror and it's a good picture, some days it isn't. But in a, a trusting environment, if the culture is right, built on real values, then we can have an honest discussion that doesn't say it's revolution, but boy, we got to start evolving pretty fast. Hey, Paul, we're going to go to the uh, first opportunity for our participants to uh, respond to a question. And the question simply is, how likely is your board to explore a strategic combination? Sometimes it's a merger, sometimes it's a, an affiliation or a sponsorship to meet strategic goals. Very likely, not sure, unlikely, never. Well, what do you think our participants are going to say about this question? Well, let me uh, let, let me uh, make a point. Uh, first of all, I do think that the learning aspect you mentioned is 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 critical because I did want to add that the best time to learn about M and A at the board level is probably not when you have a deal on the table or when you're <laughs> considering one. There's right. a lot of prep, a lot of prep that can be done to right. and make sure that people are thinking strategically about it. I, I think that's going to end up. Uh, Believe it or not, I don't know that I would have said this um, some time ago, but I, 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 I was kind of going back and forth between not sure and very likely. Mm -hmm. um, right. I don't think uh, not sure is possible because, I mean, I suppose not sure is possible because many boards do seem to be divided right. and may not have the uh, may not have the learning or the um, uh, the strategy focus that you were mentioning about uh, in the, the assessment slide. Mm -hmm. But the reason I say very likely at this point is I think it's become, uh, there have been 
just so there's been so much M and A activity, and I think there have become some very there have been some very interesting transaction as transactions as well as new entrants into M and A, like the credit unions, which have been doing some very interesting strategic things. So I'm going to say take a flyer and say very likely. Okay. All right. So let's see, Michael. Uh, can we uh, put some results up here? Uh, and uh, there you go. So basically, 60% uh, say very likely, uh, which means 40% of uh, our listeners are saying not sure or unlikely. So 60% of people are saying very likely. And I would observe that uh, based on our experience, it's not just size. It's is the integration uh, really focused around better outcomes for the people that we uh, serve. So that's uh, an interesting uh, data point. Let's go to the next slide, which talks about, uh, uh, you know, stakeholders and shareholders taking a closer look uh, into the boardroom. And I believe that we're seeing a trend now uh, where uh, I'll call it members, uh, shareholders, uh, institutional investors are saying, why are you merging? Is it uh, just for self-interest, uh, directors or CEOs, or in fact, uh, is there something deeper? And we believe, based on some conversations we're having with regulators, that there's going to be more uh, discussion about why are you merging and how is it going to be beneficial for the people you serve, including and not limited, by the way, uh, to employees. Paul, you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, that you know the the the, the why question um, is is always a critical one, and I think the reason that the why question is being asked is because there are many interested stakeholders at this time because the stakes are high. Uh, right. If you're you're if you're in a stock based company, there's the possibility for uh, less of a return historically. Mm -hmm. especially as we might approach a recession. There's some question about competitiveness for stock-based uh, institutions. And I think that the uh, shareholders in a lot of cases are asking, you know, why haven't you looked at uh, m and I think in other institutions, um, there is the, uh, for credit unions, again, for an example, there's, there's definitely uh, built into the process, the return of member uh, to member concept is really based on why are we doing the, uh, this merger? And we're seeing some very creative and interesting mergers being done these days, which is uh, has been um, somewhat had been somewhat unusual up until this point. I think that um, we're, we're, we're seeing pressure and recognition. And by by pressure, I would mean that those that have a uh, outside forces that have a real interest in seeing a company do M&A and seeing a company do good M&A, meaning if you're on the buy side, there's a lot of stakeholders that want you to justify why you're doing the deal that may be dilutive to, to shareholders for a, for a period of time. And um, I think on the sell side, there's a lot of stakeholders wondering why are you using capital or resources to, to expand? I think there's been there's been a real um, focus, and I think it's a healthy focus on uh, on, on justifying, if you will, yeah. or having rationale be behind uh, any M&A decision. So, so let's go to the next slide and take a, a look at, I'll call it, an effective assessment uh, on this mitigation of strategic uh, risk. And for me, it starts with a board and the C-suite officers looking and saying, hey, what are we trying to achieve? You know, does two plus two equal uh, seven? Uh, and if it doesn't, why are we doing it? And I will call it an intelligent exercise that builds inclusion and understanding uh, with key constituents, A, the senior leadership team, the board, uh, and the people you serve, the employees, starts to build some momentum and so asking questions like is this really a strategic fit because remember it's not just an exercise in becoming a very large multi-billion dollar institution because if you don't have the right leadership you don't have the right uh, capacity to develop products and service 
and listen to your customers, your employees. I'm not so sure it's right. And so asking where are we going, what does the strategic fit uh, look like, tells us quite a bit. And very important is what is the surviving firm's long-term strategy and where are the long-term synergies. I'm not just talking about taking out the cost in the middle. I'm talking about how do we redeploy uh, those uh, capital assets and really get something uh, moving. Let me go to the next one and talk about culture uh, defining outcomes. Because there, uh, we know that uh, combinations uh, re uh, create incredible stress for people that are making it uh, happen every day. And that's where management, and I believe the boards have to come together and embrace some type of thinking around one company, one team, and focus. And focus to me becomes a really important conversation here, Paul, because absent that, you get a check the box uh, mentality and you get advisors and you get you know, deference to attorneys and you get bankers and so forth saying, this is a good thing. Everybody slaps themselves on the back. We have a celebratory dinner. But a year from today, was that two plus two equal seven resilient? Are people living a better day? Are we able to attract a more diverse work workforce and consumer base? That brings us to the next question, Paul. How important is cultural fit to your decision in devising and considering an M&A uh, strategy? And so, uh, you know, I want to invite everybody uh, who's with us today to participate. Most important, nice to have, not effective. So, Paul, uh, when you talk about cultural fit uh, in your decision, devising, considering M&A strategy, uh, what, do, what do you think people are going to say here? Well, once again, let me preface, uh, which is probably a lawyer's hedge, right? Um, having you're said that, you're I'm, making I'm me looking, teary eyed. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. As I look at the last two slides and then come into this, I think mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, it's really, a, 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 it, to me, it breaks down to being honest and being very mm -hmm. uh, honest at the board and management level um, mm -hmm. and trying to be aligned at the board and management level. And the reason I say that is to be very, very blunt and having represented numerous institutions on the sell mm -hmm. side and, and the buy right. side, th the reality is in some cases they're just selling and right. culture and fit and all these things are not that relevant, whether they right. want to admit it or not, because they're just, and it's, I'm not, I'm not making a comment or a negative right. Right. connotation. It's just reality. It's not always honest, it's not always discussed, it's not always aligned, but it's reality. Mm -hmm. In other cases, it matters quite a bit. Uh, right. Two other deals that I'm working on right now, um, again, uh, they both happen to be uh, one's bank and one's credit union, different than the ones I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Culture matters a lot in one of them. And it's been thought about, it's been made part of a letter mm -hmm. of intent, it's been at the board level. And in another one, it matters not one iota. And right. what I would say in that case, they are being honest because they're not they're not emphasizing it in any of the, the negotiations. Right. I'm gonna say with all of that as a hedge, since it cuts both back, I'm gonna say nice to have. Okay, so let's see uh, what uh, our participants have said. So the response is most important, 69%. Wow. That's a big one. That's encouraging. That's very that encouraging. very encouraging. It shows well, that we have very enlightened people, and I'm serious about that on our line today, because people that understand the importance of culture, in my mind, really are acknowledging uh, the role and responsibility that we all have as human beings to each other and to an organization. I'm actually encouraged by this data point. Not only so, that, Stuart, but I, it, it really does recognize um, I'm, I'm encouraged and impressed because it really does recognize that uh, the, our audience today recognizes that culture is also key, not for the good, not for also the very valid reasons you mentioned, but it's key to success too. Hundred percent, and that's why things in our experience tell us culture and strategic communication from the top are critical. I want to go to the next page and talk about practices and learning and, and move ahead here. And so we're talking about 
front end of a merger and acquisition. And I want to touch on a couple of really important points and our experience on uh, confidentiality, uh, number one. And uh, don't assume that the shareholder slash member vote will be easy. And what are those showstoppers up front that uh, we need to uh, talk about? So let's start with confidentiality and just knock through these, uh, Paul, in an efficient way. Number one, what's your feeling and experience on confidentiality and NDAs? One. They are a, they're, an, they're, they're essential. They are, uh, they're a landmine if they're not properly drafted and they're not properly understood and if confidentiality is in any way breached. That is a, it's a landmine. It, 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 it's, it's not only exposes individuals to liability, but it also really threatens the very existence of the corporation on a going forward basis. And I, and I think on that point, you know, we have a mutual friend, Guy Molinari, and uh, we were involved in a major merger last year in the credit union world. And almost every time that uh, M&A committee met, uh, Guy, as an attorney, would remind people of their fiduciary responsibility and confidentiality. And by the way, this does link to an earlier conversation we had this afternoon, Paul, about the assessment, because if people on your board can't participate in something as important as this con uh, conversation, then you probably have uh, some wrong people on your board. The next one is not assuming that shareholders slash members are, are going to be enamored. And that's where, not through public relations, but through s some serious strategic thinking to discuss uh, the benefits. And I will give you a clue. Uh, Kelly Boss, myself, a colleague of mine, a managing a director at our firm, we were involved in the Northwest of the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, and the system that we designed, Paul, which was really interesting, was going right to the branch. And people were saying, well, why are you doing that? Because if the branch managers didn't understand the rationale for the merger and they were interfacing with uh, members every day, nothing good was going to come of that. And then the last is the strategic meetings of the CEOs and chairs. Paul, you have any fast thoughts on that point? Yeah, no, yeah, it's a very interesting. I, I, I do tailor my advice on that one, Stuart, for those that um, uh, where I think it would be most most productive. Um, having said that, to the extent that those meetings occur and they occur well, they're extremely useful. Um, right. So I think that the emphasis there, quite candidly, though, is being very, very prepared. Uh, yeah. I don't mean to say scripted necessarily, mm -hmm. but prepared, prepared about what you can say and not say in order to uh, to try to, uh, to to glean some things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. They can be very, very useful, but there's, there's also, uh, again, speaking like a lawyer, there can be some peril uh, with these types of individual conversations or strategic meetings, but they, they can and do work effectively at the appropriate times for sure. So this leads us to best practices um, and uh, learnings, okay? And so I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about strategic communication because absent a real focused strategic communication, uh, I'm not so sure uh, how this works in, in, in a merger. And we were involved in a merger to health companies actually a couple of years ago. And the CEO in our client was very, very insightful and smart and he said, Look, he said, Stuart, I want you to help me identify the influencers in the larger organization. He was getting acquired by a larger entity. And I thought he was so smart because it wasn't by rank and title, but it was by people who were able to move the culture, carry important, thoughtful, uh, I'll call it ethical information throughout the organization. So strategic communication that identifies uh, influencers and preparing those people, really important. And the other one, which we have here, which is very heavy, you know, it's not about the branch. It's not about the building. Those are capital assets. It's about the people. And so if we don't have an intelligent uh, way of holding on to the critical asset, people always know the right words here, employee retention, critical asset, but a way to reach out in the most efficient way to say, gee whiz, well, you're really critical to us. And here 
is the plan we're putting together. I can't tell you how much time Kelly and myself worked on this Northwest merger to make sure that the fringe benefits of, let's call it institution A and institutional institution B, were put together in a fair way so that everybody felt that they were being treated uh, equitably and, and so forth. The next slide talks about uh, best practices, okay? And so what is that best practice uh, really look for vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the customer and the culture and, and the integration pool? Uh, what's your experience in, in those conversations in a realistic way? You know, as we're talking about these three slides, Stuart, the, the best practices, uh, not by accident, we kind of identified front end and, um, and, and back end. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting. Um, I'd like to keep things somewhat simple, mm -hmm. uh, especially as I educate or work with educating boards on, on M&A. There's really three phases. There's the pre-deal, there's during, and then there's after. Uh, we professionals spend a lot of time on the during part, mm -hmm. but there's so much that a board can and should do on the pre and the after. Uh, the pre is what we've been talking about up until now, up until now, which is the idea of being prepared, meaning understanding what an M&A deal looks like, who does what, what are the issues that are likely to to come up, what are the issues that we are not anticipating. Um, mm -hmm. Just so that you're 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 very prepared in that regard. Mm -hmm. The during is pretty obvious. It's the negotiations. It's the the contractual uh, work that the professionals uh, get very very involved in. Mm -hmm. But then you have the after deal, the back end. And I think my comment, Stuart, on best practices is to 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 to, to have a real recognition that that sometimes gets lost. Right. And you know, uh, again, not speaking ill of my my profession, but sometimes. Uh, but having had the benefit of being uh, a CEO and sitting on boards as well as being a practitioner, I've gotten to see it from a lot of different angles. The M&A work starts after the deal is signed. All right. <laughs> and it goes to the exact points that uh, we've indicated here. Communication has to continue and be consistent throughout. Employee retention is, believe it or not, often overlooked or often given a short shrift to, right. to the real document of a transaction as, uh, as, way, as well as morale. Uh, right. And integration and culture have to be consistent um, you know, throughout, but that is ultimately what's going to end up making a transaction work. Uh, and then, of course, the emphasis always needs to be on, on customers, members, and, and stakeholders. So I like to put it in those three buckets because I think it's helpful, and I don't think they're all given the same uh, the same weight, and I think an educated board and an educated management team uh, would do well to think of them uh, in that regard. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent, Paul, and I, and I tell you, um, for me, I think the pride and the joy of what we do comes from the results you get post-merger, okay? Because in post-merger, you can look at learning opportunities that perhaps you didn't have prior to a merger, so that uh, your people can continue to develop and evolve. Uh, to me, that's a joyful outcome, and it's a results-driven outcome when you start to acquire more customers, more uh, members. So ultimately, it's also an expression of something that's enormously important to us, which are ethics and values. Because if values don't under, I'll call it, become the underpinning of a conversation on uh, mergers, extending those values. If it's just what you and I would call um, an air kiss, it's not really an embrace, I think you're looking for trouble. And that's why <clears throat> two thirds of all uh, mergers uh, lost market share in the first quarter after a merger completion, because the first people that walk are not the customers, interestingly enough, not the members, they're the people. And so if the CEO of the NUCO entity is not really on speed on embracing, uh, I'll call it the new people, the new organization, sharing some learning opportunities and creating a vision based on common sense, mission and values, in, in our experience, uh, you're looking for trouble. And so that's why uh, you, we may call it the back end of the merger, but I want to tell you something. That is 
uh, your legacy. That's our legacy, uh, whether we did something really good. And it comes right in, in that. And that's why, again, as a proponent, when you get that NUCO merged board together, one of those data points has to be, excuse me, about employee satisfaction and customer slash member satisfaction, because then you can see really graphically how well we're doing from the top vis-a-vis -vis reaching out with, <clears throat> I'll call it an engaging way about the future. Let's go to the next slide and talk about don't wait for a crisis, <clears throat> excuse me. And so uh, let's talk about a crisis. And you know, when you start down the road, I know we both had these situations where uh, it looks good on paper, people start to dance, they have a nice dinner, and then all of a sudden a crisis uh, emerges. Something hits the newspapers uh, and you're off to the races. Well, let's talk about that for a moment, if you will. Yeah, the way I approach this uh, topic, Stuart, and the slide in particular, is I like to look at it, uh, be prepared uh, from a merger and acquisition standpoint. Don't do a merger or a transaction of any kind because you're feeling pressure to do so due to a, due to a crisis of any kind, whether it's shareholder pressure or um, really losing market share or losing employees to competitors. By the same token, don't do uh, a, um, a buy side mm -hmm. transaction um, because you're feeling pressure to do so, meaning things are starting to get slipped from your grasp and you're, you're, you, you, you determine kind of after the fact, almost in crisis mode that we have to get bigger or we have mm -hmm. to do uh, certain things. So I think, I, I really do think that with a consolidating um, industry in the financial institutions world, as well as FinTech and other uh, industries, uh, M&A just has to be part of your lexicon. It has to be part of the, the your, your, your planning and part of your assessment of, uh, of, of risk. And I think you can prepare yourself for that effectively uh, by having um, sessions with, with outsiders or sessions or following deals or modeling deals, understanding what's going on, and spending some time at the board level on those topics, uh, I think can be very, very effective, where you're not doing a transaction in a, an extremely defensive uh, way. Okay, let me give you a practical response, because I think you, you brought us into an important point and practical, which is, if you're not proactively preparing yourself, you become a victim, which I don't particularly like. We were involved uh, last year uh, up in the Northeast region of the United States, pretty good sized credit union, but the board didn't really have its hands on a good, call it governance construct. The committees didn't have the charters in place. There wasn't a good discussion about uh, acquisition of new board members going forward who could participate in strategic conversations. And based on that uh, assignment, we were able to help that board before they got involved, and honestly, it was about a billion and a half dollar credit union, before they got involved in an M&A conversation, I would say internally, they strengthened their value pool <clears throat> by tightening up the way they functioned, their governance uh, construct, and then they were prepared to have really smart, focused, uh, strategic planning conversations about what their future would look like for the people that work for the institution and what the potential would look like. And I think that point that you just put on the table is, uh, from my vantage point, while the economy is still strong, while people are employed, while things are moving in a pretty good way, you take a time out, you say, gee whiz, here's what it looks like, here's what the percentage uh, of, and I always use the New York Stock Exchange rules for a board that you have to attend 75% of the uh, board meetings, otherwise uh, ISS or somebody else is going to vote no and things like that. But build that governance construct so it's really rock solid, and then you can have a, a discussion about M&A. Absent that, I don't believe you can control your own destiny, and in fairness, that is not where any of us uh, want people uh, to be. So let me, in the remaining couple of minutes, take us into the summary conversations. And so 
you know, we talked about today uh, strategic combinations with new uh, players. Yes, innovation. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about scale to mass economies, leadership capacity. Those are, I'll call it fundamental discussions in an hour conversation. It's very difficult to get through all of them. But Paul, uh, based on uh, your experience and what you see out there, scale to mass and leadership succession, what are the uh, one or two thoughts you can share with our participants before we turn it back over to uh, our host here at Passageways? Yes, I'll be, I'll be quick. I mean, I do think uh, uh, these are clearly topics that would uh, factor into um, any strategic planning uh, slash risk assessment of, uh, of doing M&A. And uh, I would just say that uh, there are other topics that would, would fit in as well. And at the end of the day, it's a question of understanding these issues, understanding where you are, and understanding uh, as an institution whether you're capable of doing M&A or whether you uh, perhaps do not want to do M&A, but just being uh, realistic with these types of topics and realistic with, the, with your, uh, yourself and your fellow board members or management members. And, and I think you used the right word, Paul. Uh, honest people should be able to assess the strength of their organization. And we're not saying that M&A is for every institution today. Not at all. We are saying it's a good time to take what I'll call a cleansing breath, take a look at the competitive marketplace, uh, understand the existential uh, threats that come through, uh, I'll call it Apple type, very large organizations that can develop products and services and, and erode our consumer base and put those risk discussions as part of our strategy on a going forward basis. And in the interim, when you have those discussions, no surprise, you start to acquire, I'll call it stronger talent that wants to participate in a learning and an intellectual uh, capacity going forward, creating uh, more uh, values. And absent that, uh, I question whether we can all uh, keep pace. Strategic risk, like any other risk in life, is not an easy conversation for anybody but absent that, I would argue that maybe as directors, as C-suite officers, advisors, we're not doing the right thing for the people that we serve. We need to have trust around the board table with the C-suite officers and just talk about risk and a risk of not doing anything. You can take your hard-earned family money, put it under your mattress, and hopefully the next morning it'll be there. There was no risk. But if there wasn't a return on that capital, then are we really doing the right thing? And that's the construct that I think Paul uh, and myself are trying to set up. So Paul, I wanna thank you for your time and your good thinking uh, today. And I wanna thank our friends at uh, Passageways uh, for uh, their uh, time and, and hosting and their care and helping us organize. And our team, President Al Firm, Harriet Levine, and uh, Kelly Bliss, our managing uh, director, uh, who worked so hard, Paul, with your team to get the content right. And I would say Paul and myself uh, will commit to answering offline any questions uh, that people have uh, regarding our conversation today. And we'll do that offline. And I'll turn it back to you, Michael, for closing remarks and our short survey. Absolutely. Well, thanks again. That's all the time we do have for today. So on behalf of Onboard, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And I especially, of course, want to thank Stuart Levine and Paul Aguja for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. This was a fascinating topic and definitely appreciate it. Again, we will be sending out a link to the recording of today's webinar to everyone and the a link to the presentation itself. We also encourage you to please take a minute to fill out the survey at the end. We genuinely want to hear your feedback. Good, bad, great, ugly, or meh. So your candor and honesty are most appreciated. And so with that, thanks again for joining us. And we wish you a very cordial good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very professional. Mm -hmm.